Call the Code Australia. Um, we are at day is pitch time. Yes, much wow, many pitch deck. <laughs> um, just got to find my slides. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Um, and a brief word on what we're looking for again, just to remind you, um, the judges will be looking for completeness and transferability. Um, so how fully has the ID been implemented? Can it achieve an impact? Um, and can it be transferred elsewhere? Uh, effectiveness and efficiency, does the solution address a high priority priority area? Uh, can it scale, uh, super important, and does it achieve its goal effectively? Um, design and usability, so you know you don't want to have the most awesome idea ever and a user can't use it and you won't get a job away, so is it um, user friendly and how quickly can we use it? Uh, and the last one, creativity and innovation, which I think is one of the major ones for me. Uh, how unique was this approach to, pro to solving a long-standing problem? Um, so that's what the judges will be looking for today. Um, and I've been around to some of the tables and heard some of the ideas. So I'm really excited to hear some of these pictures because we've got some great ideas. Um, I just wanted to introduce you to the judges as well. Let's meet our friendly judges. Uh, firstly, Dean Foley from Barry Yamel, which is an Indigenous Accelerator startup. Uh, hi, Dean. Uh, you're on mute, Dean, I think. There we go. <laughs> Technology. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and looking forward to hearing the pictures. Um, yeah, a bit about me. Started the World's First Indigenous Accelerator in um, 2016 and been run a whole bunch of events and programs focusing on uh, Indigenous entrepreneurship and creating a better world you know, through Indigenous entrepreneurship and technology, which has been an awesome ride. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, and amazing work on that as well. And I know, like, you are a big fan of entrepreneurship and startups and, and trying to make the world a better place. So thank you for your efforts there as well, and you're going to be an awesome judge. Um, Next up, we have the amazing Steve King of Atlassian. And I know Steve King has is always uh, working in tech for good um, and everything it can do. We're just having a brief conversation about this, about him helping out uh, with tech refugees as well. Um, so hi, Steve King. Hey, how's it going? Excited maybe, to be here. <laughs> awesome. And maybe you can introduce yourself better than I just did as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess uh, having been around um, different innovation events and innovation streams, startup streams for a while, um, for me, this, these kinds of events are just an excellent opportunity to see some really amazing ideas come out of um, what people work on. Um, I, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm happy with uh, being able to kind of go through the criteria today. My background, as, as mentioned, was kind of an Atlassian and working with um startups and and the health space uh in particular um and looking at how we can take a lot of the technology innovation we do um commercially and apply it to areas that are either underfunded or underrepresented so yeah i'm really excited about this today amazing initiative and i know you've been a long time supporter of call for code actually you've got a shirt and even i don't have a shirt so <laughs> So thanks for all your support over the years, Steve. And we, you know, as always, are, are excited to have you here. So thanks for joining us. Um, next up, we've got the amazing Natalie Gunn. Natalie uh, has been at IBF for a while. She's an experienced research manager. Um, she's got a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, and she's now working on the sales side of the fence for a little bit of a uh, career change and um, expansion. Uh, it's good to know many areas, but I know Nat is a great supporter of Tech for Good as well. Hi, Nat. Um, oh, um, yep. Yeah. Uh, so, Nat, you should be, yeah, there we go. <laughs> hey, Nat. <laughs> it takes me a little while to press the buttons to come off and turn my camera on. Yeah. Hello, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, you pretty much summed up what I've been doing. I basically make career choices based on what I enjoy and I really loved being in research and, under, and seeing ideas happen at the forefront. And what I really like about the criteria that you mentioned is that it takes a lot more than an idea to get from an idea to a product and something that really... Um, 
has an impact on society. So I think events like these are so fantastic. This is the first event like this I've been involved in, so I feel very honoured to have been asked to be judge and I can't wait to hear the ideas. I think it's always amazing to hear, you know, the, the thought, the creativity um, that ha that comes from events like this. So I'm really excited. Thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to hearing the pitches. 100%. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, and uh, last up, we have the amazing Prasad Muchela, sorry, Prasad, um, tripping over my words there, from Ingram Micro. Um, so welcome and thank you for being here. Maybe you can uh, give us a little bit of a background on yourself. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to hearing the pitches uh, from, from the wonderful participants here. Yes, I have been in the IT industry for more than 25 years and uh, had a good career with IBM before moving on to Ingram Micro. And uh, Ingram Micro is a pro prominent distributor for IBM and Red Hat and I manage both those businesses and I work with a lot of ISVs and startups and helping them take to market. So I'm really interested to see these, uh, hear these pitches and see uh, if I can help uh, you know, all three of them in fact are here to take uh, them to market. Amazing. Thank you so much Prasad um, and thank you again for your support of uh, Tech for Good as well. Um, um, again, oh, it's such a great uh, judge uh, lineup and we're really happy to have you here. Um, so next up, we're going to do the pitches. Um, so first up we have, and I don't have any slides about this, so I'm just going to stop sharing those. <laughs> uh, so first up, if I can find my little notepad, um, stand by. <laughs> Uh, tech, tech difficulties. First up, we have our Farmer's Friend, um, which is going to be presented by the awesome Adam Schenk. Uh, hopefully I said that right, uh, Adam. Uh, so I'll welcome you up to the stage to present your idea now. Farmer's Friend is using digital twin technology to solve the reliability of food source problems in a world affected by climate change. Uh, so welcome, Adam. Uh, thank you. Uh, and feel free to start your pitch. I will just. Okay, let's see if this is. Alrighty, uh, I'm going to try to keep this a bit brief. I'm a bit under the weather. Uh, alrighty, so Farmer's Friend, uh, digital technology for aiding in agricultural production management. Uh, the problem that I'm solving hunger or the food scarcity the fact that this is already a hi adam so we can see your deck um but you'll need to turn on your microphone so we can hear you as well um my microphone should but can you hear me adam can you hear me yeah, i can hear you um big dog barking in the background there uh yeah hi adam we we can't actually hear you so we can see your deck um, but we can't oh. hear you. Maybe just try a quick refresh of your of your browser might help. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Stand by. Tech difficulties. We'll be right back. <laughs> uh, so in the meantime, uh, anyone got any good jokes? Um, you know, usually developer Steve. This is developer Steve's forte. Um, I know he was telling us one earlier. <laughs> No, I'm excited to hear the ideas and hopefully um, Adam will be back in a minute. All right. Can you hear me? We can. We can hear and see you. And if you want to try um, sharing your screen again as well yep. so we can hear, see and see your awesome deck. Share screen three. Let's go straight through. All righty. Okay. Looking good. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'll let you restart now. Good luck. Thank you. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. I don't know what that was all about. Um, I'm going to try to keep this brief. I'm a bit under the weather. So uh, the farmer's friend, uh, digital t twin technology for aiding in agricultural production management. Um, the problem I'm addressing is uh, the, zero, the zero hunger, food scarcity issues, uh, the fact that we already have problems with uh, producing enough food for everyone to eat. And the fact that we've got climate change coming up with that already being a problem is uh, what I'm looking to address specifically the reliability of food production sources. So the, produce, the uh, proposed solution from my end is uh, a digital twin, which uh, for anyone who doesn't know what a digital twin is, it's uh, essentially a digital representation of a physical system. I see a lot of it used in uh, like energy production and for like complex systems like oil rigs, for instance, use, use it quite a bit. Um, it allows you to understand in real time what's going on within the system and with the data that you're collecting, if you've got enough of it, 
from over a period of time collected, you can also then begin to make predictions about what's going to happen within the system. Um, and so essentially, I'm looking to use this over a period of time to start countering some of the uh, changing climate pattern problems using machine learning. Um, OK, so the basics uh, for, for actual data collection, because one of the problems that you can encounter producing a digital twin of this sort of an issue is of this sort of a system is that you need specific types of data. And so having someone else collect that data for you deal. So uh, one, one of the ways I'm going to go about trying to, to this is by producing my own data using a guard, what I refer to as a Garduino here, because I've built these in the past is a little, uh, essentially a little box with uh, some form of microprocessor in it uh, and all the sensors you need. So a moisture, pH, temperature, and sunlight, which can then broadcast preferably the reason I mentioned an ESP32 or a, or a photon is because you need it to be able to broadcast so that it can then be uploaded to the, to the cloud essentially. Um, and so that you, what you do is you'd create a bunch of these and you'd create a grid across a, a piece of farmland so that you've got an idea of what's going on on the ground across the entirety of the farming area, essentially. Um, on top of this, you would also need some other data that you can't necessarily collect, or they can't collect yourself rather, such as uh, the weather in particular rainfall patterns, which I would use the weather company, which I know is an IBM subsidiary, in order to get. Um, you'd want to know like the mapping of the area and how the water is accumulating and how that might have an impact upon what is going on with the with the farming and with the crops in particular. Um, and you can do that through Esri, which is also a company, the GIS company. Uh, and you'd also want to know uh, external water use. So how much water is the farm using besides what's being collected through river? Um, you'd also want to know water quality issues um, related to that. And then the crop yields, but year upon year, you'd want to take all that data and combine it with the crop yield in order to try to create a model, essentially. Um, yeah, so you'd want to have a basic application that can be run on a mobile phone because you're, you're looking to provide this to farmers in some of the poorer areas of the world. So if you, if you build it too hard and it requires a really big computer, then you're going to have an issue. It's not going to be uh, usable. So you want yeah. it to be functional on a really basic mobile phone. Um, you want to, I would use uh, Node Red as an Internet of Things backend because I know that that can be connected to the IBM cloud so that you can then be given the, the real time data of the system. Um, for the farmer's end, you'd want the full with what is essentially a data dashboard with all the internalized data of what's going on within their farm. So they know where is getting where, what parts are getting water, what parts aren't, what parts are getting some, what parts aren't in order to try to optimize their, their usage of the land that they have at their disposal. And you could also then give them predictive analysis on the, of the weather from the previously mentioned weather company data. Um, beyond that, what you can then do is you can then scale it, which is kind of the goal of this sort of uh, digital twin is to then be able to take the individual nodes that, are, that you have and then centralize it by connecting them all together into one unit that then allows a centralized group, probably the government, to make smarter decisions based upon the knowledge of what's going on in the wider, throughout their society, essentially. Um, no red, connect it through the IBM cloud. And once you start having enough data over a period of time, you can start using something like the uh, Spark environments these predictions, which is the real goal here is to have enough data over a long enough period of time that the government can start making smart decisions about where their best allocation of resources would be in order to provide the food that they need to feed their population. And so they also know if there's going to be a shortfall, they know how much it is and where, where they should start going to try to get that. If there's a surplus, then they know how much they can afford to trade. So it's to basically ensure that they can better optimize their, their the resources they have in order to essentially provide what they need for their population using aforementioned technologies. Um, and now I will open up to questions. Thank you. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Um, judges, if you do have any questions, please feel free to turn on your mic and, and ask. Hey, uh, thanks, Adam. That was actually uh, the concept and I like the, I like the idea. Um, I'm, I'm curious about just two things. Uh, you mentioned uh, 
phone um, is, to collect the information and, and look at it, yeah, but then there's also the, the national or, or like the broader aggregate kind of service. Who do you see the main beneficiary of this would, uh, would be? Um, well, I think it would predominantly be the government, especially in poorer countries where they yeah, have limitations on their resources, especially places that are being affected with uh, water shortages and droughts, knowing what parts are getting the most rain, what are getting the least rain, like knowing which farms are being more productive than others would allow them to make smarter decisions. Like the farmers on the ground who, who would be able to look at their land and know where the best areas are for farming, what parts are being the most having the most exposure to the elements needed to produce food, that would obviously be an advantage to them. But the, the ultimate goal of building this sort of a system would be to provide the, the decision makers at the top with the information they need to essentially decide where to out best allocate their resources in order to provide in order to produce the food that they need to feed their populations. This is your question, if not I think if you're talking, Steve, we cannot hear you. We might have, uh, you might be a bit frozen there. <laughs> uh, do any of our other judges, uh, Natalie, yeah? Yes. Hi, Adam, thanks for your nice. pitch and for talking through your ideas. I really like how you were clear throughout the way, you know, where you were going. Thinking about climate change and how uh, everything you know, the things that we thought, the, the weather patterns that we relied on previously are changing. Yeah. Uh, do you think that you've captured the data that will reflect the dynamic nature? So the farming land that we globally use now might change. How do you think you can adapt to those sorts of changes with using this technology? So, yeah, the, the goal is to get uh, two different separate images, one of what's going on above with the weather patterning and the externalized data about the which you get from GIS modeling in terms of where the water is going and where, where the sunlight is going, where the changes are occurring on that level, but also getting the image of what's actually going on the ground. Because just because it looks like it's raining in a place doesn't necessarily mean that the water that the, the soil is adopting it. And it's it, just because it looks like it's sunny in an area from the top doesn't necessarily mean that the plants on the ground are getting the full access of that sun. So I want to paint a full picture, and the problem is that with this system that I can actually see is that like you need to start collecting the data quite soon because you want to be able to build a time series, which means you need to really start getting this data as soon as it's humanly possible in order to try to aggregate it over time. As the climate begins to change, you'll start to see this on both levels. You'll start to see this on the on the macro level with the way that the weather patterns are changing and the way that the basically the way that everything is changing on the large scale, but you'd also be able to see it on the ground in terms of some parts becoming more arid and having a harder time absorbing and maintaining the water collection and some parts being more reflective of heat, which, which is also a problem if the, if the plants aren't going to be able to either grow or you know, produce the food that you need them to produce. So yeah, like that's like sort of my main problem. My main focus is collecting this data in order to try to see where the changes are in order to provide a, a large, which is why I mentioned to the last question that my primary primary beneficiary, the government, the decision maker at the top so that they can see where these changes are happening across their nation as a whole. They can see where the where it's becoming more productive, where it's becoming less productive in order to try to direct their resources. Great, thank you. All righty, uh, Prasad? A yeah, quick question. Uh, thank you, Adam, for that pitch. You mentioned a whole bunch of sensors in your pitch, right? The most sensors and so on. That would form part of the solution, uh, and that's what uh, you know the government or the or the buyers would get a complete solution. Is that how the pitch would work with your application? Oh, the apologies, you re-ask him. He broke up a little bit on my end. Okay. Now you 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 had in one of your slides you had the moisture sensor and the yeah. heat sensor and so on. That forms the core part of the solution or, you know, it's yeah, a kind it's, of a mix and match kind of thing? And... Yeah, it's, it. you combine the ground that are telling you what's actually going on, where the plants actually are, with the, with the wider environmental data that you're collecting regarding rainfall, sunlight, where, like what's going on in the wider environment, and an overall picture. So the sensors on the ground provide 
like useful useful data. Sorry, cat's jumping on my desk. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So the sensors aren't the whole thing, but they are a large part of it because, it's, like okay. I said, you want to you want to actually know what's going on on the ground, like where the plants actually are, where the food's actually growing. So as changes start to happen, you get not just an idea of the larger, broader changes in the environment, but also specifically how that's affecting the farmland itself. Okay. I went with those sort of sensors because it was just a, an overview of what I thought we would need in terms of data. And like I mentioned before, when it comes to building these sorts of digital twins, if you are, sorry, if you are like trying to get somebody else to do it, you can sometimes have a hard time finding that data and finding all the data you need. So that data for you on the ground and the, the setup I went with is like the cheapest setup I could think of because I've, I've built these sort of things before. So yeah, you want to build something all the data you need so that you have like a full suite of what, what could be useful to you essentially. And okay. other pieces of data in order to provide a full picture of, of what's going on. Okay, cool. Okay. The, the only thing then the follow up question is, so it doesn't matter if the, the farmers are using any fertilizers or anything to enhance the, the quality of the soil, that doesn't matter. Isn't it the sensor uh, will pick it up automatically? It's the it's sensors. It would depend on what kind of, but if you're measuring like pH levels and because there's also a pH level, a pH measure in there as well and, and some other bits and pieces, then, I mean, you pick up some of it. So, and I'm sure that there's probably a sensor or two that I missed that I, that I didn't list there okay. that, that would be important, but it's for the health of the soil and the health relative to what the plants need in order to get a live picture of what's actually going on underneath the soil as well as around it, essentially. Cool. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. All righty. Thank you so much for that solution, um, Adam. Um, and Thank really you. appreciate your pitch and your thinking around uh, this kind of ag tech area, which is you know a massive field we can do a lot in. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will now ask the next team uh, to join us. Uh, so Bang Shu uh, and, sorry, Le Leah Mills uh, have designed a solution called Ethi Extension, uh, break up with unsustainability. Uh, so a browser extension to pass supply chain transparency and trust onto online shoppers. Uh, welcome, I will just add you to the stage guys. Um, Welcome. You should be able to turn your microphone and camera on now and be able to present. Uh, so welcome, guys, um, and we're looking forward to your pitch. Good luck. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Wait. Thank you. Yep. Um, one sec. I'll just share my whole window. Um, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah um yep. okay bang yep you go? all right so we are team oh, what was our team name yeah we're team complete control and we're developing uh our idea is ethic extension a google chrome extension that will help you uh will help make it easier for you to make the right choices if you're looking to ethically source your consumption Yep. So uh, on this slide, I'll take you through uh, the hypothetical use case for our target user. So our target user is a person like Charlotte. Charlotte is a young Australian who loves to shop online, but she finds it difficult to find clear information about environmental and ethical practices of many businesses. She also notices that a lot of these businesses fail to reflect our environmental concerns and they lack transparency. This leaves Charlotte frustrated and prevents her from purchasing with a clear conscience. Uh, it's here that a user like Charlotte would turn to our extension, which can help shoppers like Charlotte who are environmentally and ethically conscious find exactly what they're looking for. The product is completely free to use well, the product will be completely free to use. And as a Google Chrome extension, it's easy to install and initiate. Recently, um, there have been more and more people who are like Charlotte, people who are environmentally conscious, 
uh, about what they consume, environmentally and ethically conscious. They want to know what the things they buy are made of and where they come from. So this highlights the opportunity and the necessity of a service like this. Um, so yeah, as uh, Bang mentioned, our kind of solution to this is a browser extension. Um, initially, we'll be focusing on building it in Chrome, but um, I guess it'll have like a, a, a headless backend. So really, it could you could we could have a Firefox extension as well in any other browser. Um, and yes, yeah, so that extension passes the transparency that uh, businesses may have that we we hope to get businesses to have in the supply chain onto end consumers. Um, this is kind of uh, there's kind of three core functionalities based off that. The first is this kind of supply chain aggregator where um, businesses register with us, and uh, when you're shopping online, you're able to see the information on the supply chain if they so choose to, to be transparent with it. Um, the other is uh, the extension will kind of highlight any uh, bad things or good things. Um, for example, let's say some fashion retailer um, had some incident, some something to do with like a sweatshop, let's say, and they're in the news last week and it was really bad. Um, that might may or may not have been seen by the consumer. Um, if, if it has been seen, they may have forgotten by the time they're online shopping. And so the extension kind of brings us at the forefront whilst you're shopping so that it kind of deters you from shopping from places that are, 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 are unethically sourced, um, as well as showing you if they are, are actually ethically sourced. Um, and then on top of that, we, I guess, could have like an inbuilt search, search engine so that you can actually filter by suppliers that are ethically sourced. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the kind of inspiration uh, is there's a company called Lava, which is a Sydney based startup that do like a QR code. So it's a very, very similar thing, but uh, like in store rather than online. Um, and you scan the, this QR code with their secure QR code thing. It's, it came out of CSIRO, so it's like a, a, an invention, I guess, the, the QR scanner. Um, and it's meant to be like completely anti counterfeit um, proof. Uh, and so yeah, it's the same kind of thing where you just scan this and it, it shows you the, the kind of, it validates that, that the supply chain is legitimate. Um, Food Trust, IBM uh, have also done the same thing, QR code in Carrefour uh, in France. Uh, yeah, so again, sim similar kind of concept. Uh, so yeah, the, the thing that we're targeting is responsible consumption and production. Uh, uh, yeah, so as I kind of mentioned, that, that's done by foregrounding supply chain issues, like ethical issues, as well as you can also incorporate environmental if possible. Um, for example, if the clothes use half a litre of water versus 10,000 litres of water, um, or the carbon that's emitted by like, how, uh, the, like many different processes in the supply chain. Um, and it also shows off, uh, it, it, it's able to, and it's, it enables businesses that are being ethical to really show that to consumers and pass that on. Um, it kind of like free marketing, I guess. Um, this ultimately encourages businesses, businesses to be transparent and ethical, um, which is where the kind of social impact comes in. Um, and a kind of sub uh, impact is that it encourages business, businesses to go into supply, uh, blockchain in the supply chain um, for like transparency and, and immutability um, because we're, we're uh, pretty definitely going to only allow it to be from blockchain based supply chains because that's the only way that you know that it is um fully i guess truthful um yeah uh over to you bang so during our <laughs> during our preliminary uh market research we noticed that uh despite the fact that there are significantly more users of chrome uh proportionally speaking there are a lot less chrome extensions and applications on the Chrome store. So one of the reasons we decided to make our application a Chrome extension is, well, first and foremost, the ease of access. It's very easy to download a Chrome extension. Uh, second of all, we believe this is a uh, almost untapped market. It's, it's, not, it's not completely untapped, but we believe it's below where its true potential is. Oh, you can use Chrome extensions on Microsoft. I actually, I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, that's another reason. <laughs> um, we've also found that consumers do care 
uh, two out of three consumers would pay more for an ethically sourced product. And in a survey done in the US, 56% of consumers will stop buying from brands that they believe to be unethical. Um, so this is our very rough interface design. We didn't really have time to build it out much. Um, this is like a, essentially what the user would say. If you're shopping at Woolies, um, let's say that Woolies has signed up with Food Trust and has decided to register with us, it would shop pretty simply that kind of thing. And then there's, yeah, that that's that's simply uh, the, the idea. Um, however, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, so there's actually this kind of simple Chrome interface here um, but then when you click the read more, you have a full user interface uh, for the consumer. And there's also a user interface for the businesses to register and for the backend admin to register. Um, so uh, I think in terms of the actual core of Code Hackathon, uh, we uh, might limit it so that we only do one of them. Otherwise it might be um, quite a bit of work. <laughs> um, but yeah, essentially that that will be done in React, uh, authenticated with Auth0. Uh, the engine will be handled by node uh, which kind of just connects everything um and in terms of scalability we'll have kubernetes just to yeah add that extra layer um because really this like, like as a as a um solution i guess it is it, it, it is scalable like it can reach everyone everywhere um so i guess kubernetes enables the the tech to do so as well um yeah, so here's the kind of main part, the external part. So uh, the, a news API is just an API that I found on Google. Um, if not that, we could do like web scraping of news, um, but probably use the API just because it's easier. I haven't really looked into it much, but some sort of external news source. Uh, do Watson sentiment analysis. And uh, I was planning on doing like cross-validation to check that, yeah, like to, to try and get truth of the news source. Um, for example, if like Guardian posts that, you know, like a sweatshop thing. And then uh, there's heaps of Twitter stuff about it. And then there's also um, the HCC said something like if all these different uh, outlets all said something, then you can kind of assume it to be true. Um, I think that's probably how I'd cross validate the truth of a news article. Um, and that goes into the database that's cached for, I think probably a week or two weeks, um, each article in a business. Um, so this supply chain API is very general. So one example would be food trust. Um, Another might be like VeChain, um, but yeah, generally whatever blockchain they're using on their supply chain backend, um, we'd organize those kind of individually to be able to plug into our system. Uh, and then the ABN lookup is another API that we'd need just to validate that the businesses are legitimate and also uh, highlight to us or like a, a alert us if the business suddenly changes names or something so we can update their business profile in the database. Um, and then lastly, of course, we use SNCC for, for developer security. Um, oh yeah, this is a very simple roadmap. So at the moment we are at now, uh, we will be at, hopefully we'll have like a, a design so we can lo-fi test and um, try and talk to like a potential businesses um, that might be, uh, might be potential users, maybe try and talk to someone at Woolworths or something like that. Uh, Covcode's due, which will hopefully be the majority of what I just spoke about implemented. Um, I guess that probably won't happen though, so we'll probably have to limit it. Uh, and then, yeah, that's pretty much beyond that. We'll just go into trying to launch it. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Sorry, that was a bit uh, long. <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you so much, uh, Liam and Bang. Um, great idea too. Uh, judges, do you have any questions for the team? Judges? <laughs> I'll let Prasad go first. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Uh, Liam, thank you, and Bang as well. Thank you for the for the pitch. Uh, I have one question in terms of you know how you're using a lot of real time data. Uh, to to get that uh, that score, if you know the call. Let's say the organization has registered with you, and then suddenly some something bad or something you know unfavorable is published, right? As of today, what is the, so? How does you how do you how does the application react to that? So even though I'm registered with you, but something bad has been published. Uh, how do you factor that in? So I guess if if it was published, if it's just like one single news source ignore it however if it's published by say three or more we take it as being probably legitimate um you do sentiment analysis on it to see is it good is it bad um bad would be uh 
more uh, pressing, like good is like, okay, they don't really care that much. Um, and so then once it's bad, uh, I guess we like, it, it would probably, it would be manually checked, like just to tick off that it is good to go. Like it's not saying like, you know, it's not saying that the, the, the Louis Vuitton's trying to like take over the world or anything. It's like, you know, it's, it actually is kind of legit. Um, and then once it's out there, it'd be based off a flag system. So if someone flagged it and then we actually looked into that and did cross check and it actually was Ill illegitimate, then we'd have to take it down immediately. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Our, uh, sorry, Ben, go ahead. Sorry, go on. I was just, uh, I was just going to expand on um, that, which is our main goal with this, um, how we want to maintain accountability is our, our hope is that enough companies adopt this so that uh, if you've got enough big names on it to not have this would make you stand out, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, in the beginning, um, this is quite difficult. But if we're able to get our foot in the door, get some big names who want to appeal to, uh, I guess, the next generation, right? People who are conscious about these kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, and if we get more big names on it, then uh, think of it as almost like public public pressure, right? Like if you, if you don't have it on, uh, it's not it's not saying anything decidedly bad about you but it's a bit of a dog whistle right why don't you have this that's our that's our main goal yeah so if a company in a, in the ideal situation if a company does something like that you know something gets published and they terminate our um our service the termination itself kind of it speaks for itself right okay. yeah okay. yeah cool so, so the charging mechanism is the organization's pay to register is that how it works how you make the money or is it we, we actually forgot to touch on the revenue model in there whoops it was it was very rushed the presentation um okay. so, so at the moment we um the the revenue model would probably be just by having a, a big shopping data like heaps of data on shop on shopping and then we can turn that into our own api which people might pay for um so that's kind of what i'm thinking at the moment would be the potential revenue model However, um, like it, I, it doesn't need a revenue model for the competition. So, um, like, it, and, and I also think because it's quite a complex tech stack, I think it would probably be ideal just to open source it um, and maybe just have it as like a, a free, like initiative type thing. Okay, cool. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Bang. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Hey guys. Um, yeah, that's look. It, it's it's great. I think um, transparency is such an important part of uh, environmental, uh, I guess, statements that people make. You know, putting that whole money where your mouth is uh, thing. So, congrats on this. This is really good. Um, I had a question in in terms of uh, which Prasad actually covered a little bit as well with the fact that you've got a huge amount of data so it's, it's an intensive process to kind of collect some of that there are some existing databases around i guess um but have you thought more about whether or not uh the businesses could get more value out of it rather than just the consumers um so something like a you know audit process or an audit um kind of trail uh, or methodology that the businesses could benefit from so that they could improve their um, awareness of these kinds of issues. Maybe they're not entirely aware of how certain parts of their their supply chain might be affected by uh, environmental concerns, for example. Mm. Um, I think our hope for this is, uh, of course, it's very difficult to, to work against the interests of capital, right? Um, but our hope is that um, consumers at large uh, especially the next generation, uh, they turn more and more towards things like this and they turn away from things that are not uh, ethically produced. Um, I guess, like, not counting the, you know, the, 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 the good feeling of doing something that is, you know, good for the environment, we believe that the benefit for the companies might be um, increased interest and increased revenue from consumers. Uh, I we haven't really looked into any kind of uh, clear benefits we can give them other than that, but I believe that that is an area that we can extend in the future. I, I, I think that um, in terms of 
actually uh, consulting for them. That would be like beyond the scope of what, you know, our capabilities. So I think it, it, it's a good idea to, to have like a, maybe like a resource page or something or just a, a partnership where, where, we, where we recommend, you know, you can go down these avenues to actually try and improve your supply chain. Um, but like, I mean, that's, that's not really within our um, capabilities to give that advice, I feel. Great. Thanks. Okay. Did uh, Natalie or Dean, did either of you have feedback or comments? I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much. Oh, there we go, Dean. <laughs> Just imagine that Dean came. <laughs> um, that was really good. I did have a question actually, but it, um, Prasad answered it, uh, asked it, and you answered it. So good. And I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Look, guys, I guess I've got to jump in. I try to have a coffee to, to get a bit extra energy, but it's failing me. Um, just with two parts of the criteria. Um, so the first bit is, did you have, I know it's only you know, a short period of time with this event, but did you have any time to go out and actually talk to people, you know, customer interviews and that kind of stuff? And the second question is, are there other extensions that are doing, you know, what you guys are doing? Um, yeah, like that's both both are good questions um, that we haven't really had enough to properly um, look into. Um, we, we did send out a quick survey to, to like mates just to try and uh, validate the idea a bit um, and like gather interest. And it actually, I mean, unsurprisingly, I guess the, the um, results did say that everyone would, would prefer to buy from like an ethical source. And um, most people online shop more than they shop in store. Um, I think we had like 10 responses and 100% said they'd rather buy from an, an ethical supplier, which makes sense. Um, so yeah, we, we, we did try and do some kind of customer research, but um, yeah, we've both been at home the whole time. So I haven't been able to properly um, like talk to anyone in the industry or anything. Um, and then in terms of uh, like competition, um, again, we haven't really probably looked into it, uh, but I, I at least couldn't see anything from like immediately just searching it up on Google. Um, and I also, I've not heard of anything, um, which I, I, I generally for this kind of stuff, I kind of use that as a bit of a gauge because I, I'm the, I'm, I feel that me and, um, like my, my social group are the kind of people that would use like this sort of product exactly. Um, and so if it, if I've not heard of it at all, I, you know, I, I wouldn't think it's, it's either not out there or it's not being marketed well. Nice, thanks for that. Keep up the awesome work, guys. Cheers. Uh, yeah, 100%. Keep up the awesome work and um, thanks for spending your time here and thanks for the amazing presentation. Um, we really appreciate your time um, and energy and, and thoughts on changing the world. Uh, so thank you, Ethi Extension. Uh, and our final presentation um, is going to come from the awesome Jay Eriks. Uh, so Jay Eriks has a uh, solution called Emergency Food, which is utilizing increased knowledge in marine and new technologies in the management of natural resources. Um, so hi, Jay, please feel, uh, oh, I'll just add you to stage. My bad. Um, well, you should be able to turn on your microphone and camera, Jay, and share with us your idea. Hi, Jay. God, I need those jokes again. <laughs> uh, Jay, can you hear us? All right, we might be having a, a few issues there. Uh, developer Steve, you got any jokes for us while we wait for Jay? <laughs> I'm just going to send a message. Uh, here we go. Hey, you made it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Welcome, Jay. So we can hear you, we can see you. Um, so I'll let you uh, pitch your awesome idea to us. Very good. Thanks, Ellie. Appreciate you. Appreciate that. And uh, thanks to all of the uh, uh, participants that, uh, that uh, went before me and also to the judges. Um, uh, truth be told, I guess that um, similar to the other guys, I believe I've been uh, furiously kind of typing and uh, kind of just putting, putting polishing touches on my uh, on my presentation. 
So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm presenting a, a product called Emergent Seafoods today. Um, now, these guys, uh, the, the Dev, Dev uh, Ali and uh, Developed Steve, they run up, they seem to live on jokes. Uh, so I've got a little bit of humor for you guys to start with. Um, basically, if you recall back when uh, good old Russell Coit, um, when he was kind of uh, on the TV a couple of a decade or so ago, um, he always had the, had the kind of tagline where um, he would actually uh, kind of uh, say, uh, "What I, I'm on a diet. I'm on a seafood diet. Um, so, yeah, I guess I thought you might, might like that one. Um, let me just switch over to... Uh, Also, I should acknowledge that um, with me going last, I guess uh, that the that, that, that little bit of benefit that, uh, that I guess, uh, yeah, uh, the other guys didn't have. So, yeah, I kind of fully acknowledge that um, you guys are, are, are kind of seeing a uh, slightly more prepared in a way um, or as prepared as one person can uh, when do. Uh, Okay, so I believe you can see my screen. Ali, could you, could you just tell me if you can see my... Uh, you can see your screen, phone. Jay. Uh, you could also use presenter mode uh, down the bottom uh, right of your screen there um, where you've got the uh, kind of uh, icons. So the last yep. one before the slider is, is presenter mode, so you can transfer it to just show presenter mode. Uh, Otherwise, we can see them regardless, and this is yep. fine. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. Very good. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks again. Okay. So yes, emergency foods. Um, uh, there's good old Russell Point and uh, and uh, I guess, I guess funny as I think. Okay. So a uh, little bit of story to start with. Um, in uh, historically uh, going going back to uh, the uh, movement uh, way back in ancient way back in history. Uh, with uh, after kind of uh, emergence from uh, Africa, um, there was a the migration, population migrations uh, went around the world. Uh, they used what was called the Kelp Highway. Uh, it was where it was believed that, and uh, it's been documented that uh, uh, the uh, the kind of uh, migration, migrating uh, populations were able to utilize the uh, the, the, the kind of uh, kelp. Uh, that was available from the uh, from the sea as they were travelling uh, travelling north. Uh, I've got a little bit of a citation there as well. I'm not doing that. Okay, this is the present day scenario. Things are a little more complicated these days. Uh, food's no longer something that can be foraged from the earth. Uh, there's increasing uh, cost uh, to do with uh, kind of purchasing of food, increasing inflation, and and also kind of supply chains can issue that can occur as we saw with COVID. Um, also, there's a, a, a kind of seems to be a move uh, away from healthy foodstuffs in the natural foodstuffs in the past, and there's kind of a, a people regaining the knowledge or regaining kind of a better eating habits towards re eating uh, natural foodstuffs, and of course the focus on sustainability. The uh, so it's basically uh, people are wishing to be empowered to kind of take action on this now. Um, I guess just a little bit of light light news. I guess that there is uh, kind of the concept of uh, the uh, see the there is the concept of uh, of kind of uh, uh, all doom and glooms being associated with uh, kind of uh, food production and, and and climate change. But also, I'd like to leave a little bit of a, uh, a kind of a good advice about. Uh, uh, how uh, it has been detected that uh, that by CSIRO that uh, some areas of of, uh, of uh, kind of that have been affected by climate change uh, are kind of bouncing back. So I'll go on to that, and then uh, now onto the product I'm push, putting forward today. Emergency foods. We have a, there's a, a mission statement here that we, we kind of uh, 
looking to uh, utilise uh, technologies to uh, to empower people with uh, a new sustainable food for, food source of seaweed. Uh, and also, it's worth noting that the, the seaweed production uh, does also allow for a kind of uh, kind of significant uh, carbon capture uh, possibilities. Uh, I'll go into some further details and uh, on, on kind of amounts and, and kind of uh, figures in a moment. Okay, so uh, basically the market will be worth around thirty billion dollars uh, by twenty twenty five. So yeah, figure that's been uh, publicised by uh, Financial Times. If you'd like to know about that. Um, so how do we satiate that need? How do we kind of s satisfy that demand? Uh, well, seafood, uh, sorry, seaweed, uh, which is kind of the, the, the main product of emergency foods, uh, it actually uh, kind of grows up to two feet a day with some uh, with this particular uh, reed you're seeing on your screen, uh, Macrolatus uh, perifera, and I'm sure I'm mis mispronouncing that, but on we go. Okay. So we're looking at a, like a household uh, or home, a kind of a, a possible kind of product that would be able to be purchased by homes uh, with the home, uh, a, a kind of a container allowing for uh, the kind of growing of the uh, seafood, sorry, of the seaweed, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, mate, I'm making that mistake, uh, the seaweed, uh, basically with a, uh, with a kind of a technologically uh, kind of empowered way uh, where the kind of growth rate is uh, kind of increased to, to, its, to its extent, to its uh, maximum, uh, in order to kind of supplement uh, household uh, food budgets, effectively, or food foodstuffs. Okay, so basically, the solution that I put forward here uh, it envisages uh, the uh, Watson AI uh, kind of pulling geospatial data for the for the to assist with the growth indoors. Of the uh, item, uh, basically calculating uh, kind of the uh, temperatures that would be expected to be uh, kind of uh, experienced within the home, and uh, and then uh, basically uh, this would be the first stage of uh, detecting or facilitating which particular of the seaweed breeds, uh, of which there are fourteen thousand different seaweed breeds from around the world, uh, is appropriate based on. Kind of temperature, average temperature that will be experienced based on uh, uh, on growth rate and uh, based on kind of what, what was native to that area. Uh, so utilizing uh, kind of IoT, there would be a, a, a do you know kind of a device uh, in some households that would uh, allow for a monitoring of uh, nutrient levels, uh, transmitting uh, back the, uh, the that data to uh, to the cloud, uh, to the systems. Uh, Basically, uh, it's, uh, kind of utilizing also kind of uh, weather instruments, um, and uh, and I just I will mention uh, I will just give you a little bit of a hint that this will actually this will actually all be uh, mentioned again later on in the presentation when I give an idea of, uh, of what, what can be done as far as scaling up. So just uh, uh, so be ready for that. And yeah, just a fun fact: uh, kind of IBM weather instruments uh, pull down six petabytes of data a year. Just, just blew me away. Now, as far as scaling is concerned, um, scaling is possible through the uh, uh, through the kind of uh, devices that we've been advising. Um, that uh, and this will uh, allow for uh, kind of uh, sharing of information, sharing of uh, the expected uh, kind of, uh, conditions that uh, the individual product would, would be experiencing in households. Uh, this would also be possible to be taken outdoors, so and this could, be, could even be could even facilitate uh, kind of uh, like like people go fishing uh, or people go crab 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 uh, crab uh, fishing and uh, crab potting. Um, they uh, can uh, this could even be uh, kind of transferred through to uh, kind of allowing for that to be done uh, kind of by your normal. By your kind of uh, purchaser, by your, uh, by your, uh, uh, even by your, say, children of a household could actually be able to see this uh, this process uh, or kind of experience this process for themselves um, by going and actually uh, growing seafood out in the wild, either say in the backyard using another using another emergency food uh, 
kind of container, or perhaps even if uh, given uh, kind of uh, authorization from uh, and consideration from uh, landowners and authorities um, that potentially could be grown outdoors. So basically, uh, this would also allow for uh, uh, oh, little type of thing. Sorry, that I might even just kind of fix it on the fly. You didn't see that. You didn't see that. I'm kidding. Um, so basically, it's whereby uh, the uh, could even be uh, kind of transferred or scaled up to a global uh, kind of level uh, that with the kind of, with the significant with the amount of uh, kind of uh, these containers that uh, that obviously will be able to be kind of manufactured uh, sustainably as possible. Uh, that, uh, that multiples can be uh, kind of uh, manufactured and also deployed out to uh, even kind of countries uh, that, that are experiencing kind of uh, food shortages. Uh, so basically, uh, I uh, you have a uh, uh, facilitation facilitating, uh, say for uh, Ethiopia is kind of typically the the uh, unfortunately blighted by uh, food shortages regularly. I believe also in North Korea, there's a lot of talk of, uh, of that occurring there. But basically, uh, the, the uh, kind of the create, manufacture of these and also kind of manufacture using uh, uh, kind of a 3D printing as well as possible, uh, that that would kind of effectively empower that, uh, that, uh, that community to, uh, to kind of uh, to exist. Uh, or to thrive even. Okay, so as far as the health benefits are concerned, um, just briefly, there's uh, the kind of the uh, I, kind of daily intake of a, of a seafood diet. Uh, you, you get uh, pretty much uh, uh, quite a quite a bit of your uh, kind of uh, RDI or recommended daily intake. And and of course, there's also a kind of a, a little reference to uh, kind of, uh, the the kind of internal um, Kind of key bodily functions kind of it supports okay so on the topic of the uh of the cost again i just mentioned this again that mark is 30 billion uh, per by 2025 and uh and that at this point i uh I thank you for your time thank you for your attention and uh i, I welcome your questions Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Jay, uh, for that. We did hear you. And I'll invite Thanks, the judges um, to ask questions or provide some feedback for you. Thanks, Jay. All righty. Uh, do any of our judges want to provide some uh, feedback for Jay or have any questions on, on the business use case here? Can, I jump on? can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Um, hear you now, yep. thanks, for you the, thanks for the um, description, and I love the images that you had on your slides. Did you? So you're talking about you know uh, leveraging the, I guess the health benefits of seaweed uh, and potentially this untapped resource. And I think you were talking about having it in you know in the home, kind of like a seafood uh, herb garden almost. Yeah, that's a good way did of describing it. Very, the, very good. Did you think about the footprint of having, the carbon footprint of having all the resources that you'd need? So like the, you know, the water and the pot and all those sorts of things? Sure thing. So in regards to uh, that aspect, uh, uh, we, I didn't quite get, I'll be honest, I hadn't quite kind of drilled into that. Uh, uh, yes, besides uh, uh, the, uh, kind of concept that uh, that the as far as nutrients are concerned, uh, it is possible that that uh, kind of fairly easily available nutrients are able to be uh, kind of used to feed the uh, feed the seaweed. Um, it's uh, you can even use uh, even if you want to kind of go down the path of just having it as a uh, as a kind of a, a conversation starter. There, that you don't eat the seaweed. It's the seaweed. Um, you could even actually use uh, a kind of uh, let's say. Uh, how do I say this politely? Um, um, you can use um, waste product uh, to, to kind of a to to kind of a to kind of a, uh, grow the, uh, the the item. Um, and it's actually uh, another benefit of the uh, 
of the item is that uh, it is actually able to kind of uh, purify and uh, and also uh, uh, effectively kind of take a lot of uh, kind of any type of nutrient you want to put in there almost, it seems. Uh, that is something that I, I could also go on to into more detail with you on uh, on kind of how it can also assist with out, out, and, out and about uh, the uh, when you kind of when the people want to try it kind of for themselves, uh, kind of growing it outside of the uh, outside of the home and maybe in a in a in an environment and in the environment perhaps. Uh, but uh, I will come back to state that uh, uh, yes, I, I'm afraid I don't have those figures exactly on, on kind of power usage. Uh, besides uh, what you what can be typically kind of taken from on what uh, a, 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 a you know device uh, kind of utilizes. Um, I can say that uh, with scaling, uh, there is a possibility of uh, with one household having an Arduino device, um, that, that actually could even mean that another household next door or nearby doesn't need the Arduino device. Um, basically, when, when someone would purchase this product, they'd, reg they'd be registering uh, and also that would also kind of uh, uh, advise whether they need to get an Arduino device or whether they can actually use a kind of like a crowdsourcing of the data that's being being pushed out to them via uh, the uh, emergency food website. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. I think Steve, did you have some comments as well? Saw you pop up before, there we go. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, uh, Nat asked a pretty close question. Jay answered a pretty big chunk of what I was going to ask anyway. But um, I did, um, I guess I did want to uh, highlight um, the education side of this. So um, it sounds like most of what could be done is pretty transferable into a lot of different areas, a lot of different um, uh, ways and scales. So whether it's a small scale, local you know personal or large-scale community or maybe a town for example like there's a lot of benefits here um but i'm curious about whether you thought about the education piece of how uh you get people to um get started with it i guess um and and really like it's not actually a huge um uh, part of it i was just real curious about as soon as you started talking about it, I was I was pretty much googling like, oh my god, this is actually really fascinating. How do you get mm -hmm. started? Um, so yeah, sure. I was wondering if you thought about that. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, you, you you use the kind of typical kind of strategies that uh, your, your your Maccas use, and uh, maybe using uh, kind of cute images like cute mascots, uh, perhaps a, a kind of like a, a fish like Dory, uh, uh, kind of just kind of a, an a kind of individual. Animal, a cute animal that would actually be eating the sea, seafood, like the like the kind of, like the market would be, uh, like the uh, individual uh, kind of a consumer would be eating it. Um, that would be kind of uh, uh, also kind of uh, kind of that message would also be pushed on the website, and uh, and kind of would, would also have kind of like the uh, uh, Dory, not Dory for legal purposes, uh, kind of do that Dory. Would kind of take the take the customer through uh, what the benefits of, of kind of uh, the healthy benefits and also the kind of sustainability benefits uh, and also uh, provide information on the uh, greater uh, bio ecosystem as well kind of give them a, kind of a a sustainability and also kind of environmentally conscious view of things. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Jay. Um, Dean or um, Prasad, did you have any uh, or all good? <laughs> Going to take silence as all good. Oh, here we go. Prasad. Sorry, sorry Prasad. All good. Oh, I, I, I missed that, but I think it was good work. <laughs> thank you, Prasad. Thank you, Prasad. That's the case. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> All righty. Um, thank you so much, uh, participants. We are going to give our judges about 10 minutes to deliberate now, um, and then we will get back to you with the results. Um, thank you to all the teams for participating. Really amazing um, that you've spent your time trying to think about how we can, you know, facilitate our climate 
change uh, climate change initiatives in the world and use tech for good to do so. So um, big thank you to all the participants for your ideas um, and passion for this area. Um, and we'll let the judges deliberate. Thank you.